Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sunil Kumar, and I have the privilege to serve as the provost of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, it's also my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh annual Social Determinants of Health Symposium. I've been provost for only two years now, so I was here last year. And I must admit, uh, last year was about, uh, the audience was entirely school children from the city of Baltimore. And while you're a fine audience, they were louder. Uh, this event, as Bob said, is co-sponsored by the provost's office and the Urban Health Institute. It brings together, together hundreds of people from across academia, community-based organizations, government, philanthropic organizations, and other groups to examine important issues facing Baltimore City, particularly for young people. The focus of this year's symposium couldn't be a more timely and important one. 1968 to 2018, Voices of Social Change, Empowered Communities for Health and Social Justice. This theme emerged from conversations last fall between Baltimore residents, Senator Barbara Mikulski, and the Center for Africana Studies at the university. The goal today is to spend the day reflecting on the past 50 years of social and political activism to help us learn important lessons from the past as we strive to create lasting change in cities across the country. And at the risk of stating the obvious, I must admit that last year alone has made us even more sharply aware that progress is not guaranteed and we must continue to work together to build community partnerships and stay diligent in our goal for a healthy and just society for all. I'm thrilled that we have gathered today such an exceptional and distinguished group of speakers to help us guide us in these critical conversations. Thank you again for joining us today. I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Bob Blum and his terrific colleagues at the Urban Health Institute who have supported and put together this event. Thank you, Bob, for your stewardship of the Institute over the past uh, several years. And with that, I'd like to turn the podium over to Ron Daniels, president of Johns Hopkins University, for the opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunil, and good morning to you all. It is a privilege and a pleasure to join my colleagues from the Urban Health Institute, including its director, Dr. Bob Blum, uh, the co-directors of the Johns Hopkins Center for Africana Studies, Dr. Kuchina Bell McDonald and Lester Spence, and our former senator from Maryland and now Homewood Professor of Public Policy, Barbara Mikulski, in welcoming you uh, as well as our distinguished guests and participants. In March 1968, Reader's Digest, a publication with a huge national audience, ran a version of a long article that had previously been published in the Baltimore Sun about community centers staffed by members of the police force. The article highlighted the connections between police officers, black and white, and the neighborhoods that they served ending with a line, in Baltimore, there is hope. The Reader's Digest version went so far as to title the piece, wait for it, how Baltimore fends off the riots. As we now know, devastating riots swept through Baltimore the following month. In the wake of those riots, there was a raft of analysis and discussion by various groups about what had happened and what could be done to address not the violence, but the conditions of racial and socioeconomic inequality that helped ignite them. The members of the Greater Baltimore Committee, a group of local business leaders, show that at their April 19th Executive Committee meeting, one member suggested that the GBC could and should apply its business know-how to the search for solutions. Now I'll admit, that reading those room, uh, minutes uh, was more than slightly painful to me. The GBC still exists in Baltimore, 
And as president of Johns Hopkins, I, along with Ron Peterson, are ex officio members of its board. Not long after the unrest following uh, the death of Freddie Gray in police custody, 47 years to the month after the 1968 riots, I sat with Ron and my fellow board meetings and discussed exactly that issue, how to apply our business know-how to the search for solutions. The hope, of course, was to see a different outcome when faced with far too many of the same challenges. And in truth, that's the essence that, of why we're convened here today at a moment when, by many accounts, the national and local narrative is often one of despair, of gridlock and polarization, of lack of progress to the, towards the goals and aspirations set by the movements and organizations that you will talk about today, from the unfinished work of the Poor People's Campaign to the aims of faith leaders to end violence in wars overseas and on the streets of our neighborhoods in America. It would be naive not to acknowledge that the lack of progress across so many different measures over the last 50 years. One has only to look at the recent study by economist Raj Chetty and his colleagues that marshaled compelling evidence to show that white men face far better, uh, do far better economically than black men do even if they begin life in similar economic circumstances. From health disparities, to educational attainment, to incarceration, the statistics seem to tell the same story. But we would not be here unless there was a sense of possibility, a hope for a different narrative, one that speaks to the optimism that we see growing in various parts of this city. This narrative does not deny the very real challenges nor seek to obscure the ways that so many, including our own institution, have not always lived up to its ideals. Rather, it is one that allows the past to inform and to shape our actions in the present and commits importantly to seeking measurable, lasting change. I see that narrative unfolding already, embodied in those represented here today, and the work already underway. On the first panel alone, we'll see the evidence of sustained and renewed commitment in the path-breaking legacy of Senator Barbara Mikulski, the Congress's longest-serving female official, and Congressman Elijah Cummings, who walked the streets of Baltimore during the unrest in 2015, and then went back to Congress, as he has for more than 20 years, to advocate for policies and investments that would directly change the outcomes for people like Freddie Gray. It is evident in the work of historians and sociologists who are helping us interpret the events of the past and using them to discipline, inform, enrich the debates of today. And it is especially clear in the work of young people, people like the Urban Health Institute's Bunting Neighborhood Leadership Fellows, community leaders, leaders from East or West Baltimore who are developing their skills in the service of improving community health and well-being. And I see it unfold in the stories of those who have secured jobs or built their businesses through programs like the expanded City Summer Jobs Program or our own Hopkins Local Economic Inclusion Initiative, which among other things, this past year hired 334 Baltimore City residents from the most distressed neighborhoods in the city. Indeed, uh, many of those were among the 121 uh, ex-offenders who were hired at Johns Hopkins institutions this past year. Again, something that my colleague, Ron Peterson, was very active in championing at our health system, and it's something that bled over into the university. And we've now adopted this as a best practice and feel very proud to be part of this program. On April 19th, 1968, that same day that the GBC meeting was considering how to deploy its business know-how to better the city, the Johns Hopkins newsletter, this is the undergraduate uh, newspaper of uh, Johns Hopkins, ran an editorial directed at its largely student readership, stating the case a little more bluntly than others had at the time. You had better start giving a damn, the editors wrote, because the country is in an ugly mood right now. They continued, you 
are responsible and you will share in the consequences. It might have been stated with more eloquence by others who took to the national stage a half century ago, but the point our students' editors made echoes in this room today. What is clear that you are all here, and many of you are still here, because you gave and you continue to give a damn. You, indeed all of us, understand the consequences and accept the responsibility for doing better. You want to break the cycle and produce a different outcome as we continue to face off against the distressingly familiar challenges with the hope that when our successors convene in 2068, the conversation can be different. Thank you for being here and for the work that you do here and, when you and uh, that you will do when you leave here today. Now I'd like to turn things over to our colleague and the director of the Urban Health Institute, Dr. Bob Blum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Provost and President Daniels. Uh, I have a question uh, for those in the audience. Could I see the hands of those here who were born in 1960 or earlier? Great. Can I see the hands of those who were born between 1960 and 1985? And can I see the hands of those who were born 1995 or later? Fabulous. So there are two reasons why I've asked this question. First of all, how you can engage in the conversation. Since we have over 700 registrants uh, today, passing around a microphone to raise questions would be challenging at least. So what we will ask is that you submit your questions. For those born in 1960 or later, we have the opportunity <laughs> for you to post your questions on a piece of paper, raising your hand, and one of my colleagues will pick them up. For those born after that and before 1985, we have email as an option, and for those after that, <clears throat> we do have a Twitter account, and you can post your questions that way. <laughs> There's a second reason why I asked you to raise your hand, and that is we see this conversation as a dialogue between generations. It is not just about looking backward. It is about looking forward. It is about honoring the past and those who have walked before us. But it is about learning from the past so that, as Santana said, we are not condemned to repeat it. Now, I will assume that even if you were alive and active in 1968, some details might elude you. And so, in a few minutes, I would like to just briefly share with you some of the historical events of that tumultuous, terrifying, exciting, painful year, both for Baltimore and for our country.
And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my home and be free.
Welcome Professor Lester Spence, uh, who will uh, moderate our first esteemed panel. So because we have a, a powerhouse panel, uh, what I'm going to do is just make one comment and then just get into it. Uh, there's one, when we're thinking about moments of crisis, uh, when Senator Mikulski got together a group of folk to think about what, uh, what we'd be doing this year to commemorate 1968, one of the things she and other people brought up is the role of ideas in crisis. Um, and a, in a normal moment, you know, kind of what we want shapes how the nation proceeds or what we want maybe might shape how, we, how cities behave. Uh, and the, sometimes it's not even what we want or our interests. Sometimes it's institutions, like Hopkins itself as an institution in Maryland may actually shape how uh, Maryland politics uh, proceeds. But when in moments of crisis, institutions are disrupted and sometimes we don't even know what we want, right? So it's in that moment that ideas play a really, really powerful role. And I think in 1968, that was one of those moments where ideas really came, uh, came to the fore. And I think given the events of the last few years, this is another moment where ideas can, can come to the fore. Now sometimes when we're talking about ideas, we're talking about new ideas. Sometimes what we're talking about is basically going backwards to kind of recapture ideas uh, from a previous era. So to this extent, given that it's 2018, we thought going back to 1968, thinking about that moment and thinking about the ideas uh, in that moment might help us, help us uh, problem solve this, this current, our, our contemporary condition. So with that, uh, I'll talk about, I'm not gonna, I'll say the panelists by name, you guys know who they are. Uh, going to my left, uh, in some cases ideologically, uh, we have <laughs> Senator Barbara Mikulski, to her left, Lieutenant Governor Kathleen uh, Townsend, uh, to his, her left, uh, Representative Elijah Cum Cummings, to his left, historian Taylor Branch. So first question I have for you all is, and I think maybe I'll start with you, Taylor. Talk a little bit about, Bob Bloom actually gave us, uh, we had a really interesting, a uh, really good slide presentation that talked about some of the historical events of 1968. Could you put that more in um, historical perspective? I hope so. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I want to I was asked to give some personal testimony and then a historical overview. And I'm going to try to do that very briefly. Um, Fifty years ago, I was a college student uh, trying to, um, and I'd become a student activist trying to get us out of a war in a poor country, Vietnam. We were trapped in a war, just like we are today. We're still trapped in wars in poor countries. Um, to do so, I, I left my school and was going around trying to find a candidate that would end the war. And I went to Canvas in May of 1968 in Indiana for Senator Gene McCarthy, who was the first candidate who came in against the war against a sitting president of his own party. They sent me to Canvas in the black neighborhoods of Indianapolis. Um, and uh, we didn't do very well. Senator Kennedy was very popular there. Uh, he won that night. Uh, I went and missed my plane to come uh, and sat in the airport all night and about midnight, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around and I was looking at Kathleen's father, Senator Kennedy, who said, I see you have a McCarthy staff badge. Would you have breakfast with me? Um, and he opened up the restaurant in the, in the Indianapolis airport, and from 12 o'clock till 5 o'clock, we argued about the war uh, and about his role in it. And he said, why, why did I support McCarthy? He couldn't even go into black neighborhoods. And I said, well, he got into the war before you did, and you didn't get in until it looked like you could win. And he said, uh, 
I didn't want to get in until I could win. It wouldn't do anybody any good if I didn't get in until then. I said, well, you're trading on your name. He said, I can't help my name. All I can help is what I'm doing with it. Um, it was the most vivid experience of, of my life. Um, that summer, I worked on the Georgia Challenge campaign. Uh, we challenged Lester Maddox, my governor in my home state of Georgia. Uh, my job was to go around to black churches and recruit people to come. It led for me to be a delegate in the Chicago Convention that year um, on the Julian Bond Challenge delegation. Um, so I went from war to race to a life basically framed by the notion that it was the, it was the, the courage of a movement that went on of largely young people all through my childhood that shoved in motion things that really changed this country. Um, and, and, and still is doing that. Uh, when I went to graduate school that year, there were no female students at Princeton University. We're here. We do not, we can't remember these things, how, how enormously the black-led movement shoved into motion equal citizenship for women, for disabled people, for senior citizens, for uh, gays and lesbian people that was beyond anybody's radar. All these things have happened. What we have failed to do is to recognize two things. Number one, all that motion toward equal citizenship was shoved into motion when briefly the country dealt with the original sin of race relations, and it started liberating everyone else at the same time. However, it also set into motion a politics of denying that. If the government and we the people means that we need to address race relations, our politics said, I'm against the government. Uh, I'm against Washington. It was the beginning of cynicism. So in my view, we are still stuck 50 years later in a country that is blessed by the student activism and the black-led movement that set all this into motion, but we are cursed by a politics that denies all of those blessings and that still shies away from all the, but the most superficial engagement with the race issue in the United States. You want to respond to that? You know, as I listen, first of all, I'm honored to be with you and honored to be here at Hopkins. And um, as I listen to Taylor, I could not help but think about my mother. My mother died about two months ago. And on her deathbed, you know, I was asking her, I said, Mother, um, are you ready to die? My mother had been a Pentecostal minister, had founded her own church, had done, raised seven children successfully, a uh, former sharecropper, domestic. And um, she said, I don't want to die. And that really shocked, I mean, she said, I'm afraid to die. And I was shocked because her whole life had been spent trying to get to heaven. <laughs> and she said, I said, why, Ma? She said, because I don't want to see my people going backwards. I don't want to go out like that. that those are the words. I do not want to go out like that. I think Taylor basically said, back in 1968, here I was, 11th grader at City College High School, traveling from Emerson Village to City College every morning, sometimes getting up 5 o'clock. Why? Because of a hope. I had a hope that, that, that Elijah Cummings could be a lawyer one day. Um, but I also had a hope for my people, for African-American people, because I had seen so much in my life. I, as a matter of fact, when I was in the fifth grade, I helped to integrate a riverside pool in South Baltimore, where people beat us and threw all kinds of rocks and kicked us. And that was a slam in, the, in, the, in my face of racism, of people who did not like me because of the color of my skin. And at the same time, we had Martin Luther King, who was my hero. I would rush home from church every Sunday to listen to WWIN, where they would have his speeches. Anybody remember that? 
Come on now, don't leave me out by myself. I would lay, I would literally lay on the floor and listen to Martin Luther King's speeches. And so now they killed my hero. So I had, I, I, I was going through, I mean, in, in the 11th grade, we had a group of people who were basically the anti Martin Luther King. Not anti, but they felt they didn't believe in that nonviolent stuff. Then you had another group who believed in King. I believed in King. And so, but then my hero was gone, and he was gone through violence. So it was very, very, a very difficult time for me. But, but I can tell you, I had, but I still had a hope, although, you know, the fires were burning and we had all kinds of riots were going on, I still had a hope that through this, some kind of way, my people would advance and that I would advance. And somebody asked a question in, in, when I was reading the, the prep material for this about what would you do? What would you encourage activists to do? I would encourage activists to make sure that every single child gets a good education. And I really mean that. And I'm sure that my, the other guests will agree with me. If you've got an education, it makes a world a difference. And we all have to fight for that. But again, I see our progress as African Americans. We move forward. And then something happens. Then we get a Trump come along. Oh, my God. Um, but you, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? We got, and, and so, but we had to keep forging on. And we cannot forget our progress. We cannot forget. Barack Obama is very, very significant. Yes. We cannot forget point. that. And so, but at the same time, we got to make sure that we lift all boats. I'm finished. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Taylor, and thank you, Congressman Cummings, and, uh, for, and Senator Mikulski for helping to organize this extraordinary day, and for each of you for coming. C can you hear me? No. Could you all hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure. I didn't want to say all that and you didn't hear. Um, so. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the fact that, you know, Taylor talked about my father in 1968 running for president. And just one of the things about what, you know, he was, he was also uh, killed in 1968. And when he, uh, we had a mass for him in St. Matthew's Cathedral in New York, and then we were going to take the train from St. Matthews to Arlington and Washington, D.C., where he could be buried next to my un uncle, John Kennedy. And we all thought that train would be you know, three and a half hours, as most trains are from New York to Washington. And in fact, it was about an eight-hour train, because spontaneously, with no organization and no planning, two million people came to stand by the train mm -hmm. and to salute my father. And there were um, white people and black people, working men and women. And he appealed, in a sense, to people who went on and voted for George Wallace. And then when he came to Baltimore, African Americans came to the train station and sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And it was an extraordinarily moving seven and a half hours. And as somebody said on that train, what did my father do to be able to attract people all across this country to come and stand and mourn him? And I, I guess what part of it is, is that he had enormous physical and moral courage. 
If you ask, what do we need today? I think that's what we need. And I'll just tell you the story of what he did after Martin Luther King was killed. He was campaigning for the presidency. He, went in, he was landing on a plane in Indianapolis. And when he arrived, he was told that Reverend King had died. And he was, told, he was supposed to, at that point, go into the inner city and give a talk. And the mayor of, this, of Indianapolis said, don't go in, it's too dangerous. And the police said, don't go in, we can't protect you. And you can imagine why they might be right, because 119 cities that night came out in flames, including Baltimore. But my father said that's what his campaign was about, was going into the city and talking with people. And he went in, and they're all the, in a small park, and, and he asked, has anybody heard what happened? And they said, no. So he said, he had to explain that Martin Luther King had died. And then he said, my own brother was killed by a white man, if you resent white people. And then he quoted Aeschylus, pain which we shall not forget falls drop by drop upon our heart until against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. He's quoting Aeschylus in the inner city of Indianapolis. And then he also quotes the great Greeks, let us tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world. Let us love one another, whether they be white or they be black. And Indianapolis was one of the very few cities in the country that didn't break out in riots. Why is that? I think it's because people understood that my father cared deeply, understood pain, was physically courageous to go out, and morally courageous to say, we are all in this together. And what we need, I think, out of our politics today is a love for one another, a respect for one another, a sense of dignity for each person, rather than condemn those with whom we disagree, understand where they came from, and talk with them, and listen. That's what he was able to do. I'd like to talk more about how he also was able to say tough things to people. For instance, we're at a, I think I have a minute left, we, we're at a medical health care. One minute. And so, he was, when he was campaigning, he always said, the tr he, he believed so deeply in America and in Americans that they could hear the truth. So when he called at the University of um, Indiana for health care for all, all Americans, and the 800 medical students in the first row groaned at the very idea, and one said, who will pay? My father said, you will. You're fortunate. You're all white. And the African Americans are fighting 12,000 miles away in Vietnam. They don't have your choice. They don't have your money. They don't have your privilege. You have a responsibility. That's why we're all in this together. Well, in 1968, I was a 32-year-old social worker uh, working in Baltimore. Change was in the air. And we were being propelled by two great social movements, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. Old institutions were coming under challenge. You saw that in part of the, uh, in the uh, slides that were shown earlier. And when we wanted to commemorate today, we didn't want it to be a gathering of activists who told old war stories and wasn't that all great to all get together and reminisce. The whole idea of commemorating 1968, and until 9-11 was the most tumultuous and seismographic public year of my life, where we lived through two assassinations, the implosion of the Democratic Party, the worst and bloodiest, bloodiest year of the Vietnam War, to end the year with the election of Richard Nixon 
and the astronauts on Christmas Eve circling the Earth, reading from Genesis. So what we wanted for this commemoration here today, because it's not a celebration, it's a commemoration, was to remember, to reflect all of us, though, and then to recommit. Because the times were being propelled, as I said, by the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. The anti-war movement will be spoken about earlier. Kathleen talked about her father's words, which were the college kid anti-part, and then will be the Catholic social justice, which we'll hear later. But for me, I'll tell you where I was. I was working in Gay Street. I was part of a whole reform effort. Change was in the air because we were gonna do things differently. We were fighting two wars, a war in Vietnam, and a war against poverty, and we weren't winning either one. One we knew we had to get out of, and one that we knew we had to get more in, into it. And that was the whole idea of really moving. And the very, all of us who had voted for Johnson in 64 for the Great Society were outside the White House saying, hey, 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 LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? That was the anti-war movement. But here, the whole idea of the civil rights movement was that if we felt we could get the right legislation, the right Supreme Court decisions, we would be okay. When Dr. King was assassinated, and I heard this when I was over at something in East Baltimore, we knew this was a tragic day. It was on a Thursday night. On Saturday, while I was working at home, I got a call from Art Cohen, I see in the audience, who was a legal aid lawyer at the time. They're rioting on Gay Street, he said. And he became the first casualty by getting out of his car to take pictures and was hit by a golf club. But the riots came. My job during the riots, I was because I was running a program called community services, decentralized services, get closer to the poor, be with them so that they had rights and opportunities as well. My job was to organize the social service response to being able to, where, where were, we had no cell phones, we had no iPhones, where were people going to get their food? How were they going to get their prescriptions filled? How were they even going to go to work? There were National Guard on the street. National Guard. But we had a mayor who did wanted to be sure if you control the crowd, do not harm the people. After the riots calmed down, a governor by the name of Spiro Agnew, who the liberals had voted for two years earlier because the Democrat had campaigned on your home is your castle, which was meaning no fair housing summoned the civil rights leaders to a meeting at the State House in which people like Karen Mitchell and other distinguished people from the Ministerial Alliance, people who had really worked in the streets and neighborhoods to calm the neighborhoods down, not in a pacifying way, and to get food and medicine and so on out, into the, out to those who needed it. Then Agnew chastised the black leaders for not doing enough to control your people, those people. The language of the day and even the language of today. Richard Nixon saw Agnew and that's why Agnew picked, I mean, that's why Nixon picked him. But for me, and I'll wrap up my part. So here we were, we worked very hard to deliver social services, but the city had changed. There was tremendous white flight there was also white flight of institutions. Hospitals couldn't wait to move to the suburbs or to the edge of the suburbs. Three hospitals decided to stay. Mercy Hospital, University of Maryland, and this institution had a meeting of the Board of Trustees to decide what they were gonna do. And they knew they had an obligation to be here and to be in East Baltimore, and they stayed. For me, I decided I wanted to double down. And that what I wanted to do was really back a presidential candidate. Gene McCarthy was not my guy. He was all about ending the war, but not ending a lot of other things, though he spoke about it. 
So that was the constituency of conscience as they campaigned on. But Bobby Kennedy was campaigning on a constituency of change, which was change for everybody, to lift all boats, that not to pit one group against each other, that he believed honestly that the people of Appalachia who were poor should not be pitted against the black people in Detroit or in Baltimore, in Chicago, who were being poor, that we were all in it together, and that the ship of state should be part of an armada to lift all other boats. That's what I was part of. That's what we've kind of lost along the way. That's why we've got to get back to it and be that constituency of change. So, so as I look on my own life, uh, my career is basically made possible by the events of 1968. Students at the university, black students took over the University of Michigan in 1968. The programs that they implemented there actually allowed me to go to the University of Michigan as an undergraduate, then as a graduate student. I'm now co-director of Africana, Africana Studies, the Center for Africana Studies. Um, Africana Studies as an idea, black studies as an idea didn't exist without student protest. The first black studies department happens in 1968. So I can talk about my own life and talk about the role of education, you know, the, the, the political movements of that time, how it made a space for me. Uh, but if you look at education, if we, we focus primarily on education, there's something that kind of looms large. If we look at uh, wages and productivity, right? Like our productivity has gone up, has skyrocketed, and our wages have flatlined, no matter what our education level is, right? Uh, Johns Hopkins tuition, I think, was about three grand in uh, 1970. It's about 60 now, including housing. Uh, if you look at fellowships uh, or, or grants and aid, the amount of grants that students had have to go to schools like Hopkins or Michigan have decreased significantly to the point where students are coming out with debt. So when we think about education, uh, without that political backbone, without those public policies, what we're proposing is, we're proposing at best is a circumstance in which students are better educated, but they have less power to exert control over the government that they're supposed to have power over, and they have less control because of the debt burden to make decisions over their own lives. So as we actually recommit, what types of policy should we be recommitting to now, and then, given how politically, how, given the range of political actions people engaged in in 1968, what type of politics should we be engaging in now? Well, I thought a lot about this, and first of all, I'm gonna thank you and uh, Dr. Katrina McDonald, as well as Richard Blum, for making this day happen. Because when Hopkins said, let's do some big splash, and we talked about 1968. Really, it was the Africana Center that stepped forward. Your wisdom, your scholarship, and so on, we, this day wouldn't have been possible without the School of Public Health focusing on disparities and giving us, providing the venue and, and for your work. But when I, and we ought to give them a round of applause. I never thought I'd say this, but the senator is not really telling the full truth there. <laughs> But, so, back in the day when it was 1968, I thought when we did something like a Supreme Court decision, like a legislative victory, like the Civil Rights Act, it would be done, and it would be done forever. We would never have to go back to it, and that we would never go back. The big thing that I've learned over the years is every day and every generation is called to keep it going all over again. That shouldn't be discouraging, it needs to be energizing. Don't be discouraged, have courage, be energized. And that's the point of being involved here with all of you. We're a certain vintage here. <laughs> Don't I talk better now? Yes. Oh, yes. And 
Anyway, and that's the whole idea of the recommit. And what I'm so impressed about is this new generation, whether it's the Parkland kids or the people in this room, want to know about the world and they want to change the world. But they want to go beyond social media organized protest into policy, into program. And the way to do that is what Kathleen talked about, is politics, politics, politics. We need to register voters, we need to turn out voters, and you need to get the government you want, not the government you drink coffee and talk about. Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure many of you all saw 60 Minutes yesterday, the segment, they had a segment uh, about Princeton and, uh, and also about the Gates scholarships. And what they, Princeton has a program now where they um, give special preference to uh, low income folks and fo first generation. You need to see it, it's powerful. And it's not, people would say, oh, that, oh they, uh, affirmative action for black people. No, it's, it's, it's for everybody. Low income, first generation. You know what they discovered? And they give them scholarships, full, full scholarships. They discovered that these kids do just as good or better, or better than the other kids. In other words, they just need an opportunity to, 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 to get in to school and show what they can do. Um, so often, you know, I, I tell people, it's one thing to have opportunity, it's another thing to know about it. Come on now. Um, it's another thing to, to, to know about it. We, we do a, a scholarship fair, and I'm just gonna say this, every year. And you'd be amazed at the number of people who don't even know about the Maryland scholarships. Don't have a clue. But yet they have been paying into a system over and over and over again. A little story real quick. And this is my father, again, fourth grade education. Barbara, he says, uh, when I got ready to go to law school, he said, boy, where are you going to go? I said, daddy, I'm, I'm, I've applied to all these schools. Well, what, what, they, got, they got a law school downtown, don't they, boy? I said, yes, sir. What's the name of that law school? I said, I said University of Maryland. He said, um, he said, why you ain't going there? I said, well, I, I didn't think about it too much. He said, I want you to go there. I said, Daddy, you don't know anything about law school? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, I done paid for it. <laughs> and that's where I went to law school. And so what I'm saying is, a lot of times, there are opportunities available. And again, we got we to gotta make the policy. We've got to help people stay informed. But again, the things that Hopkins are doing, the, and, 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 corpor and by the way, let's not leave our corporations. Corporations can have a, a major bearing on policy, too. And by the way, we're all buying stuff. Stuff. And so, again, I think there are ways that we need to, to get um, leadership in these corporations or encourage them to do good things. I think that then encouraged more people, more corporate type to do good things. And the next thing you know, you have a snowball effect. Um, but I think we have to use a lot of, there are a lot of tools that we have to use to get to where we have to go. Thank you, a Congressman, I agree. I think one of the um, things to, if you think about what's going on today, is to really focus on power. Who has power and how do you use power? Um, you know, when Senator Mikulski talked about how she thought the law would, the 1964 Civil Rights Act or the 1965 Voting Rights Act would solve our problems, I have to admit, because I grew up with my father, who always would quote Goethe, he only wins his freedom and existence who daily conquers it anew. In other words, every day there is a fight. There are always people who want your power and to take it away from you, and you have to fight for your power. And therefore, you have to analyze who has the power and how it's being used. If in some countries, in Europe, for instance, all higher education is absolutely free. 
free. So nobody graduates from college in debt. They graduate with a degree and they can go on. It's a choice in our country that we decided to put people in debt. So we don't have to do that. It's not inevitable. It's not inexorable. It can be changed if you use your power to change it. So that's number one. Number two, when I was growing up, 35% of Americans in the public sector, private sector, were in unions. So even if you didn't have the high degree, you could have a decent wage and decent benefits and a decent pension. That was about power. And so when other parties get in, they try to eviscerate the union movement. What you have to do is say, no, it's not just about how an individual is going to get their education. Important as that is, you have to figure out who has the power, how it can be changed, and how you can get it. That's how you can make lasting difference. Every day, fight for your power and fight together with others. The historical perspective, I'd like to add, endorsing everything that, that has been said here, is that we, re we need to remember where some of the levers that we have to fight for power and raise hope came from. In 1968, when I went as a challenged delegate to Georgia, with, to the convention in Chicago with Julian Bond, the governor of Georgia appointed all the delegates. You couldn't fight for power within the Democratic Party the way it was organized, and that's why we challenged them. That's why we won. During that convention, we were seated, and now parties, you know, have rules about who can be there, the, the women, the minorities, that they're, that, that they're more balanced. That came out of the civil rights movement and the struggles there. When we were there, there was a desperate, after Senator McCarthy flamed out as a, as a, as a one-issue candidate, there was a desperate attempt to nominate your uncle, Ted Kennedy. My job, she was he was going to be nominated by Fannie Lou Hamer. My job was to make sure that nobody stole Fannie Lou Hamer from a little place with a door where you're supposed to go out. And for an hour, I sat there with Fannie Lou Hamer. It's wow. my second unbelievable memory from 1968, aside from arguing all night with your dad. So I'm there with her, and I'm saying, Ms. Hamer, what are you going to say if you go out there? And she said, oh, I don't worry. The Lord will tell me what to say. I'll put his name in nomination, and he'll win if they let me nominate. So. So ultimately, because of the stuff way above my pay grade, uh, this didn't happen. But it made me remember that the movement put this hope and this change into motion. And we should remember that and never forget also, the, don't ever take for granted the things that we have, like political parties that are open, like the fact that that when I went to Princeton that in graduate school the next month, there were no female undergraduate students at Princeton, and the next year I saw the first ones who arrived, and they were mistreated and yelled at, and ugliest things yelled at them that you, would, you wouldn't believe. But that was also set in motion by the civil rights movement. And, and it goes all over the place. At that time, there had been 2,000 years of rabbinical Judaism and the idea of a female rabbi was preposterous. But the first female rabbi was ordained just a few years later out of the civil rights movement, which made people struggle over what, where hope comes from out of equal citizenship. So don't take for granted the freedoms you have, and more likely than not, they came from a civil rights movement that was offering hope when it was hard to do, like Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, God will tell me what to say. And underlying what he just said, we have to make sure that we protect our democracy. Right. It is so very, very important. I think that when we talk about taking things for granted, sometimes I think we take our democracy for granted. But our democracy allows us to be able to live the lives that we live. And, you know, uh, Taylor, as I was listening to you, I was just thinking how, you know, what is normal one day uh, is not normal the next day. And so we have to create our own normal. We have to create, create our own destiny. And when the students, with regard to the gun issue, uh, came forward and, were, and had to march, I felt so happy 
because I felt that here, was, here were people who were principled. They get it. And they wanted a sense of normalcy, and they felt that they were doing something to make a difference. And we had to keep those kinds of efforts going forward. But it goes back to what my mother said. She didn't want to die because she knew that every fight was a fight, but she didn't want to die thinking that somebody was pushing her, her back. And so I think, you know what, and, and if you listen to everybody up here, it starts with somebody who determines, or bodies, who determine, I'm going to shape my own destiny. But, but they have something else. They care about somebody other than themselves. And they want to see society go forward and, and be bigger and better and a, and a better sense of normalcy so that everybody rises. Um, so we're about to move to the moment where we're taking questions from the audience. And I, I see a couple already. But I actually have a, 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 a question, um, particularly for my white panelists. And, and I, I'll focus on the white panelists for reasons I'll be, be clear. Um, one of the things, wonderful things that happened either last week or two weeks ago was Arizona teachers struck. Mm -hmm. And a number of them voted for Trump. And mm -hmm. the New York Times ran a story, and there was talking, talking with a number of these Arizona teachers who realized perhaps for the first time that taxes matter, and that even as they voted for Trump, they realized they had made the wrong decision. Now, I don't, I am not going to say, it's important to note that that type of, of dynamic, and these stories are, are running all the time, that type of dynamic is not unique to whites. So all you have to do is look at, from a black folk in the room, all you have to do is look at your timeline for the response to the Cosby verdict. And you can see evidence of people, of black folk, looking at facts that are right in front of them and still saying, well, no, Cosby being set up. So I, I don't think that this is a white thing or a black thing. but. It's unlikely that we're going to see changes uh, like we saw in, the Arizona, uh, in Arizona and elsewhere without significant white involvement to talk to whites about, about their political decisions. What type of, going back to 1960 and thinking about some of the work that was done in that moment, what type of work do whites need to be doing, and not just whites, but do they need to be doing to talk to those folks to, to deal with this kind of reaction? Well, first of all, in 1968, most of us who were activists didn't know where we, where we were going to go. But we did know we were going to go. And that's the lesson from 68. It spawned a whole generation of activists. And when you're going to be an activist, how did I know trying to get insulin to diabetics in the neighborhoods during the riots, that three years later, I would be in the city council having broken the back of the Baltimore machines. Now, that's not because of me, it's because of a whole lot of we that supported the being tired of knocking on doors and having those doors slammed. And they were going on in white East Baltimore over the highway, the urban ethnic communities, which I was speaking for, but because of involvement in civil rights, and I was a simple foot soldier, I don't want to exaggerate that, but over on West Side was homes being taken, and we formed a citywide coalition. We were called SCAR, they were called RAM, we formed a group called MED. The city had never seen blacks and whites organized together to save their homes and their neighborhoods. Now, that's, and then it spawned a generation of running. More African Americans ran for political office than before. And this is what we need to think about. Advocacy is not a social event. It's not only going to a single protest event. It is important. We were all protesters in one way or the other. So protest, I'm not minimizing that, but protest needs to go into action. And here's my last point about it. Be best at what you're best at and be best at what you're needed for. Be best at what you're at and be best at what you're needed for and do it. And change comes from the conversation at the water cooler where you hear misogynist or racist jokes, don't laugh, speak up, to asking your corporation or nonprofit 
Are you paying equal pay for equal work? What is the minimum wage that our people are getting? Wherever you are is where you need to be to do something and then be part of a large organized effort. And if we don't get a big turnout in 19, in the, in the coming election, 2018, then the biggest march should be the march to the polls. And by the way, for a lot of you, think about running for office. It's not easy. We can talk about that. And sometimes you win and sometimes you don't. But the question is not do you win, but does society win? If you're talking about uh, reaching out to whites, I think one of the challenges um, that we've seen in the Democratic Party is a certain elitism and the way they talk about people with whom they disagree. Um, they say they're stupid. That's a terrible thing to say about anybody. Um, they say the word was deplorable. That was a terrible thing to say, and I think you know Hillary regrets it. But what I think was special about my father and what I think he taught me is to understand that everybody comes to their position for some reason. So rather than to condemn them or think you're better than them, try to understand them. And as we learn, we're supposed to love one another. So you may not like the Trump supporters, but there's a reason that they believe what they believe. So try to understand them, reach out talk. Um, they're often members of your own family, if you don't live in Baltimore. But it really is an extraordinary effort to, rather than be righteous about your own position, be humble about your own position, and understand that many people have lost a sense of purpose for themselves, that many people have lost a sense that they have a, a place in the world. The largest number of suicides last year were from white men, white working class men, who died at higher rates than people died in the AIDS epidemics in the 80s. That is a sense of despair. And so rather than be righteous with them, I think we have to have our heart reach out to them. And if people felt they were respected and that they felt that there was some dignity from others, I think you would have a less of such a divided country. I think what I would say to white people is what I would try to say to the whole country, which is we're in an era that wallows in cynicism on the media and in our dinner table conversation. And it does endanger our democracy. And you almost never hear anybody say, well, how did we get into cynicism and how do we get out of it? And I think that's what we need to do is to recognize the privileges that we have and the, the, the great tribute, because I think a lot of the privileges that we have, if you want your daughter to go to Princeton, you owe something to the civil rights movement, is th that the civil rights movement offered hope when they had less reason. It's Fannie Lou Hamer is offering hope when she's a sharecropper who could barely read, but she memorized the Bible and, and, and knew all the wisdom in it and, and, and brought hope forward. So I, I think the main thing I would say to people, do not settle for the cynicism that you see 24 hours a day on the news, because if we do, we really will endanger our democracy. I think that people, um, you know, I, I've had, sitting as the uh, ranking member on the Oversight Committee has been a very, very interesting experience for me. Um, the first chairman, um, Isa, uh, one of the richest men in the Congress, and here he was sitting beside one of the poorest. Um, but we constantly talked. The dialogue kept going, even when he snatched my microphone away from me. We kept talking. And I believe that, if, and, and we eventually became friends because I understood more about what he went through and he understood more about what I went through. I learned more about why he was, listen to this, interested in criminal justice reform 
because he had a brother, he has a brother, who got convicted of a crime early in his life and could never get a decent job. So there are things that we as human beings, not Democrats, not Republicans, as human beings experience. We have some other members. Uh, then, then I had um, uh, Chaffetz uh, from Utah. Congressman Chaffetz, before he became chairman, he invited me out to his district. Now, you know. Come on, now. <laughs> <laughs> I flew out to Utah, and he said, oh, I want you to see the, the arches, the arches. Oh, he just talked about that forever. And when I got there, I just, it was some rocks. <laughs> but but, we, 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 but, but while there, I had an opportunity to talk to people who could trace their land ownership all the way back to the Indians. And then I got a feeling, and then he showed me, he took me in a helicopter and showed me all this land that they felt that the government was taking advantage of them, you know, so they couldn't do anything with it. And, he was, and, and so then I began to understand the thinking a little bit. So when he came to Baltimore, I took him to an AIDS clinic. I took him, Senator McCulsey, to a senior citizen meeting where this senior citizen said, uh, you know, I know, you, I know you, you, you big and all that, but all I got is my Social Security and my Medicare card. Don't take it from me. I saw him change right there. And he talks about it, and, I, and, then, and, then he, and then he, about a few days later, he had gone to the White House to see the president. And the president said, he said, yeah, I was in Baltimore with Elijah. And he says, uh, the president says, this is President Obama. President Obama says, well, well, how did it go? He said, well, it went well. He said, well, and he said he came to Utah. He said, well, what did y'all do in the Utah? He said, oh, we went on to see, see the arches, and we saw this, and we had a nice meeting with, uh, went floating down the river and all this kind of stuff. He said, what did you, what did you do in Baltimore? We went to an AIDS clinic. He said, I think, I think uh, Elijah got the better of that deal. <laughs> the, the fact is, the fact is that sometimes the sharing of information, and now I have Gowdy, and he and I talk all the time. A lot of people think we're, we're, we're not friends, but we are, and we're able to chip away. Am I able to get everything I want? No, but I want him to know that when I speak, I speak of pain, pain, passion, and purpose. I want them to understand that I'm not there just being, just, you know, taking up a seat. I'm there because there are people who are hurting. There are people who I met at this hospital after being six months here, six months as a patient. And I got to see them and I talked to them about these patients and what they're going through. My point is, is that a lot of times we need to communicate because we will find that we have so much more in common. And, 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 and those, those things that we have in common can propel us to greater things. Yeah, thank you. So I see a, a, I've got a couple of questions that come to me already. And what I'll do is I'll ask them uh, both. They're, they're, they're related. Uh, one is someone asked a question about incarceration rates, like uh, going back to the education, like uh, one reasons, one of the things that prevents individuals from achieving all they, uh, all they desire, uh, that prevents them from attending schools like Hopkins or Michigan, is, their, um, is the issue of incarceration. How do we deal with that? Uh, then secondly, what are some of the opportunities for, uh, for organizing in Baltimore and in other places, given, uh, uh, given recent events? I'm talking in general. Y'all can. Well, as, as far as incarceration rates, I mean, when I was um, in office, when I was lieutenant governor, we had a program called Hotspots in which we went into the, hot, the highest crime areas of the city and around the state, and we set out a goal to reduce crime in those areas by 35% in three years, and we succeeded. 
And why, how did we succeed? Um, and so if you reduce the crime, you reduce the incarceration because people aren't going to jail. And what we did is we put police in the communities. We had a community leader who would work with the police. We had after school programs. We redesigned the light system so that it was easier to see. And we put parole and probation officers from the central office into the community so they could help people find jobs, find uh, drug addiction uh, services. So there are things that you can actually do to re reduce incarceration if you're focused on doing it. Everything, you know, as, as my uncle, President Kennedy, said, these problems are created by man, they can be solved by man if you want to solve them. The question is, do you have the political will to solve them? Which goes back to electing people who want to solve them and actually are serious about getting the job done. But it can be done if you want to do it. I've done it, I've seen it, and, and I can tell you other examples across the country in which you can actually really reduce crime. They've done it in New York City. It's, and therefore, people don't go to prison. That's what we have to do. The, uh, you know, the, the consent, the consent decree that we had here in Baltimore was so very, very important. Um, Senator Mikulski and our entire team worked to make sure we got that consent uh, decree through. But if anybody wanted to just do some reading, you need to read the report, the DO, DOJ report, uh, uh, about what was happening with our Baltimore City Police and what they and how they have descended upon communities like the one I live in and have lived in for 35 years. Um, and a lot of people say, well, just because you um, have complaints about the police, uh, that means you don't like police. Well, I've got police in my family. Um, and I respect police. They're very, very important. But, but at the same time, when you read that DOJ report, and you see the stops of African American men with no arrest, with no, with no arrest, uh, no citation or uh, anything. I mean, it, it, it reminds me, to be frank with, it reminds me of South Africa. Um, and we're better than that. We really are. And I think that we have to make sure that we have police who are sensitive and, and understanding and have respect, very important, have respect for the people that they are to protect and serve. Um, but the other piece to that is that we, 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 we've got to make sure that we get back to what you were saying, Kathleen. That is bringing the community back together with the police and, and, and creating a new sense of normalcy, because the normalcy that we have experienced is not healthy. Um, with regard to when we look at our incarceration rates, there's so many, and we, you look at our policies with regard to bond, uh, bail bonds and all that kind of stuff. I mean, a person can, can actually be doing pretty good. Come out of high school, maybe got a nice little job at Hopkins gets stopped for some tail light or something. Next thing you know, he ends up in prison, can't make the bond. Next thing you know, he loses his job. I mean, and it's a snowball effect. And next, you know, next thing you know, he's on the street. When you talk to the young men in my neighborhood, you know, slinging drugs, you know what? They're not making a lot of money. I mean, some of the guys up here are, but the guys, the, 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 the regular, they're just trying they're to live from day wage. to day. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is we've got to look at our policies and be realistic, and we've got to shame ourselves that we put so many people in prison, and so many of them are people of color. I got two things for 2018 and 2020, and these are determinative dates, and they're determinative dates in terms of politics and in terms of public policy. One is the election of 2018, and who will control the House and who will control the Senate. This is really crucial. Also, though, in this state will be something 
related to our school funding. The commission that will be report, reporting on the Kerner, not the Kerner, the Kerwin Commission. This is the formula. This is the commission that will determine the formula and the criteria for distribution for state aid to public education. And if you don't want Baltimore to lose out, you got to get behind the Kerner Commission. Now, also, there will be on the ballot what to do with the casino money. You remember the casinos? <laughs> the casinos were going to provide jobs, which in many ways they have. So in this state, you're more likely to learn how to be a blackjack dealer than a cyber security expert. But the casino money was supposed to come back to neighborhoods impacted by the casinos and also to, what other two words? Public education. So you want that money not to be in lieu of what the state would have spent anyway, but to be in addition to. Right. That's what the voters voted for. We don't want an Arizona walkout, not because we're opposed to the teachers, but the underlying. So one, pay attention to 2018, register to vote, yeah. go to vote, and keep your eye on those two things. Now let's go to 2020. 2020 will be a presidential year. I'm not gonna get into that here. You all know what you're thinking. But it will also be, the com there are two other things. The 19th, it will be the commemoration of the 19th Amendment. The 19th Amendment is when women got the right to vote. We women should register every eligible woman in America yeah. and turn out for the poll. And also we have the census, the constitutionally mandated census, not of citizens, but of residents. Most federal funds, and Elijah can speak eloquently to this, most federal funds coming to states and local governments are based on formulas. All of your Title I, all of your money for Elementary and Secondary Education Act, your Medicaid funding, your money for mass transit, Elijah, that red line. Right, that's right. Which was a dumb thing. Red line is about sidelining. We wanted a jobs card. But we want in 2020 the president that we think would reflect our values, but also we need to focus on the census. And if this city does not have a full count where this state will lose out for a decade. So we need to mobilize all of the talent in our, and this is where the public health school, all of us can be a big help, to make sure there are no hidden figures. If you're homeless, if you're afraid of the government, if you didn't want to tell your landlord there are three families in a household, we need to make sure that everybody counts in this country, but everybody will need to be counted so we get our fair share of the money and then have the leadership to deal with it. Kerwin, Census, 2018, you know what to do, 2020. Well, let's organize in whatever group, your professional association. Don't tell me, I'm afraid to do this because I might not get my grant. They won't think I'm neutral and evidence-based. Nobody can be neutral about racism. Nobody can be neutral about poverty. And anybody that says you'll be penalized for that, change them. And I think the young people were saying, lead, leave, or get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, just to take, piggyback on that. This census thing is very important. It comes under me in the Congress. There's a, they, there's a deliberate effort. It's deliberate to make sure that places like Baltimore City are undercounted. I'm, I'm just telling you. Yes, that's right. Um, and we're, we've got this new question uh, the citizenship question, knowing that if you ask that question, a lot of people will not fill out the forms. I'm begging you, I'm begging you to make sure you tell your neighbors and everybody, those census forms are very, very important. As a matter of fact, they are so important that right now we have a total of eight members of the Congress. I mean, if, if people j jiggle around with the census enough, you could be actually reduce that to seven. I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but
but, but I'm just saying, those are the kinds of things that can happen because of the sentences. Um, you know what? So it says technically we're supposed to be going on break right now. So what I'm going to do is I want us all to thank the panelists. And, and I, I want you all to stick around, but I really want you all to think about, to think about what we've been talking about, right? Where the, 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 the conference is about the social determinants of health. Health is, public health is by definition a product of politics. And the more we think about this as a product of politics, the more we expand our common sense. Remember what the Lieutenant Governor says. We actually, we can make all post high school education free. We can actually do, some places, in some places that's a thing, right? Debt doesn't have to be normal. Somebody asked me, like, what can we do to help students manage their debt? Well, one of the things we can do as a public is get rid of it, right? So, so think about that. I want to thank profoundly, particularly Senator Mikulski. She's at the end of my hall. She gets it in every day. Every day she's here and she doesn't have to be. And then finally, for those of you who are really interested in talking about kind of uh, politics from an activist perspective, on Wednesday at 7.30, there's gonna be uh, a panel discussion uh, led by Mark Steiner actually continuing this conversation. How do we actually make the parties that are supposed to reflect our, our political interests actually reflect those interests. So on that note, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. I am honored to be on this panel with you and have a great rest of your day.